Hello, and welcome back to the Not Dead Yet vlog. My name is Jules Good, I use they, them pronouns, and I'm the assistant director and policy analyst at Not Dead Yet. I'm a white person with short brown hair, and today I have on a short sleeve blue button down shirt, uh, and behind me are a few assorted pictures and graphics hung up on my wall. It is LGBTQIA plus Pride Month. Today, we're taking a closer look at the intersections of LGBTQIA plus and disability issues, especially as they relate to the current policy hellscape, of, I mean, <laughs> landscape in the US. We're going to take a specific look at issues facing disabled transgender people, especially those with intellectual and or developmental disabilities and mental illness. This population of people is facing an erasure of rights at an alarming pace, resulting in their harm, traumatization, and death. These discriminatory policies, coupled with a policy of assisted suicide and the continued devaluation of trans disabled lives, creates a bleak outlook for this community. But we have the power to mitigate this harm, and that starts with being informed about the issues at hand. Let's dive in. Part one, what is gender affirming care? Gender affirming care is a crucial form of health care for transgender people. It includes a wide variety of medical, psychological, social, and sometimes surgical modes of care that help people transition from the gender they were assigned at birth to the gender they identify as, the gender they truly are and wish to embody. We've been hearing a lot in the news recently about threats to gender-affirming care for youth in several states, but the impacts of those threats extend to trans adults as well. Before we talk about specific policies, let's learn a bit more about what gender-affirming care is and why it's so important with Jen Insight, a trans video creator and writer. Just to start off, could you please introduce yourself with your name, pronouns, and a little bit about who you are and what you do and why? Of course. Hi, I'm Jen Insight. I use she, her pronouns. I am a transgender content creator like TikTok, YouTube, all that sort of fun stuff. Um, I really just try to be visible and show people sort of a window into the trans joy that many people uh, that live the sort of life that I live, experience on the day to day, but may not be at the forefront of a lot of the reporting on people like us. And also to just be visible for people who need to see that there's a clear path forward if they're feeling these feelings, if they know that they are in fact transgender, but they're not sure what to do after that. Amazing, thank you. Um, so if you could just like explain like I'm five, in the simplest terms possible, um, what is gender affirming care? Yeah, absolutely. So like at its very core, gender affirming care is telling people that you believe them and doing that through your actions, right? Because in many ways, like to sort of like dovetail off of the explain like I'm five, right? When it comes to kids who may be trans or gender non-conforming, the first and probably most profound thing you can do is let them express themselves the way that they want, whether that be using the correct pronouns, using the correct name, uh, allowing them to dress in the style that is most appropriate for them, right? And that basic philosophy follows through all the way into adulthood, right? Because at our very core, and I don't pretend to speak for all trans people, but here I am, um, <laughs> We really just want people to accept us for who we are and believe us when we say who we are. And then there are other things that go into that as well, right? Because like the inner critic, that dysphoric voice that many, but not all trans people have, uh, there are other avenues of affirming care that might be more medical, more physical, um, spiritual even. Um, that all sort of comes from just being believed by society and yourself that you are who you say you are. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Um, if you don't mind sharing a little bit, um, what has your experience of gender affirming care been like? Yeah, absolutely. So I've been very lucky in many ways. Um, when I first really was like, this is something I've known about myself forever. My earliest memory of wanting to be a girl is from when I'm about five, six years old, right? Um, and I just really repressed it because like I said, there wasn't a lot of uh, representation. There was no clear path forward until I was about 30 years old. After that, I was very fortunate to have 
friends in my life that were very um, encouraging. They're just the sweetest people. Uh, I've been very lucky in my um, professional life as well. I remember uh, I came out to one of my bosses and uh, she hugged me and it was the first person that I had gotten like that sort of over exuberant happy response from. It was the first, it was the first one that felt like a congratulations, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then on top of that, like I've been very fortunate that a barrier to entry for my specific uh, healthcare needs, in particular like my hormone replacement therapy, very low barrier to entry. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, last question I have for you is, what is at stake if people lose access to gender affirming care? Quite frankly, their lives. Like, not to make it too grim, um, but gender affirming care saves lives in so many different ways, right? And the fact that in many states in this country, or in just this country in general, uh, people's access to these things and the ability to make decisions and have control over their own bodies, being in jeopardy is really scary because there are already, that I'm aware of, trans people fleeing this country because they're worried about what's to come. And there are other people who kind of despair spiral about it, right? Like, if they lose access to this, this joy, this fulfillment, this self that they have been able to cultivate now is in danger of disappearing maybe forever, mm -hmm. right? Um, what I will say, sort of buoying that up, though, is there has been a great response from a lot of the transgender community around mobilizing uh, organizations, protesting, uh, voting, all that sort of stuff, because we know who we are, and we are not going to allow some out-of-touch politicians to tell us otherwise. Mm. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. If you want to learn more about gender-affirming care, the independent nonprofit newsroom The 19th recently put out a great article titled The 19th Explains, Everything You Need to Know About Gender-Affirming Care. I highly encourage you to read it. There is a link down in the video description if you'd like to do so. Part 2. Disability and Gender-Affirming Care Trans people are about twice as likely to be disabled as their cis counterparts. While there is no proven, concrete reason for this, researchers in the field have theorized that the chronic stress of dealing with discrimination and violence, threatened or actualized, contributes to negative health outcomes that can result in long-term disability. Additionally, the Center for American Progress reports that nearly half of white transgender patients and nearly three-quarters of transgender patients of color have had a negative or discriminatory experience with a healthcare provider, including misgendering, denial of gender-affirming treatment information, and even refusal to see the patient altogether. 40% of white transgender patients and 54% of transgender patients of color reported delaying or avoiding preventative care due to fear of discrimination. The lack of quality healthcare access here is alarming, and that's before we even get into the policy problems we're dealing with right now. As we learned earlier, gender-affirming care is a critical, life-saving form of healthcare. As such, general healthcare disparities caused by structural racism, ableism, and classism impact access to gender-affirming care, as the Center for American Progress data clearly shows us. These disparities are caused by a long and complex history of prejudice. You can learn more about that in our video on ableism, which I'll put a link to down in the description. But now, access to gender-affirming care is being threatened in a much more direct way for those with intellectual and developmental disabilities and mental illnesses in some states. In Missouri, Georgia, and Arkansas, legislation has been proposed and in some cases passed that explicitly limits access to gender-affirming care for autistic people and those with, quote, mental health comorbidities, end quote. For a closer look at this, I sat down with Larkin Taylor Parker, Legal Director for the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network. I'm Larkin Taylor Parker. I'm the Legal Director of the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network. I use they, them pronouns. I'm uh, young-ish. I don't know when I should stop saying that. Um, <laughs> white person with my Zoom background wall behind me. Um, various bits and pieces of personal memorabilia. Thank you. Um, 
Can you give us a quick breakdown of the emergency order that the governor of Missouri put out in March related to gender affirming care and what the current status of that is? The order was an incredibly disturbing development. It placed so many barriers to gender affirming care that it would have been very difficult for it to happen at all in Missouri in any situation covered by the order. So it's harmful to all trans people seeking medical support for their gender confirmation, um, any, any kind of medical gender confirmation care. It was also very specifically ableist because it called out autistic people and people with mental health disabilities as populations that needed to be watched and screened for. It required that everyone seeking gender affirming care get an autism assessment. And it also effectively banned gender confirming care, gender affirming care for people who um, had any kind of mental health disability. What was particularly bad about this was the way in which those things served as an across the board obstacle and the way in which this was just designed to terrorize providers. It wasn't designed to set criteria that would protect anyone or require anyone to stop and think before seeking gender care, as condescending as, as that even is, because by the time people seek care, they've generally thought about their identities a lot. But it wasn't designed to, to do even a well-intentioned but condescending thing. It was designed to terrorize providers and their lawyers and shut down care altogether. And how it would have done this was all of these arduous requirements, sort of compliance things like the autism assessment that would have been very difficult for providers to meet, a high risk of liability for providers, and a lot of uncertainty. And in terms of, of mental health disability, that section was purely discriminatory as well. It didn't set the standard for getting gender care at inf ability to inform consent. <laughs> it set a standard of having a diagnosis, essentially. So one's ability to consent didn't matter. Functional capacity didn't matter. It was purely about whether someone was labeled. I don't know what to call that except discrimination on the basis of having a disability label. As defined in that order, so many people have a mental health history that would make providers afraid to treat them. All of the language about the mental health condition having to be resolved. Mental health issues come and go. Many people have mental health disabilities throughout their lives. And also, even a, a mental health condition of short duration isn't usually something you can do a blood test for. What that was in there to do was make providers look at someone who had so much as a history of grief counseling following a loved one's death 10 years ago and be scared that if they were ever called on it, that mental health history might not count as resolved enough to protect them from liability. Thank you for that. That was really helpful. Um, and yeah, just terrifying across the board. Um, how does that sort of compare to the law um, SB 140 that was signed into law um, in Georgia back in March? 
The law in Georgia targeted um, minors more than people across the board. It also called out disability, not necessarily um, in the form of a blanket ban, more in its explanation of purpose. And while that's not quite as aggressive, quite as, as inherently and assertively an attack on trans disabled people as that nightmarish order out of Missouri, it is very concerning. It's concerning because the implication there is that if someone's got a disability, the choices that they make for themselves, for their own body, are inherently more suspect than if they hadn't been labeled. The suggestion that autistic people need extra paternalism that others don't and can't possibly know our own genders, our own gender identities in the same way that our similarly situated non-autistic peers can is ableism, plain and simple. And it plays into long-standing attacks on the bodily autonomy of disabled people, particularly, but by no means exclusively, those with intellectual and developmental disabilities, mental health conditions, or both. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, something I noticed as I was doing a little bit of research about this was I haven't, I didn't see any bills or laws in years past that specifically mentioned disabilities as a reason to deny or delay gender affirming care. Um, is, is that, is that a new thing for it to be so explicit? And if so, why do you think that is? It is as far as I know. And I think the combination of increasing awareness that autistic people are trans and gender nonconforming at higher rates than the general population is colliding with this attack on trans people's rights across the board, regardless of disability. And it's easy for individuals who just don't want certain people to have rights to play up ableism to further their attacks on trans people. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's been clear that the disability is is kind of used as a, a way to make people an easy target. Um, is there anything else um, kind of about this issue that you think people should know, um, resources that people should look into, um, just for folks who maybe aren't familiar with um, this specific kind of cross-section of, of issues? I think that people should know that sometimes even when the worst possible measures are rolled back, the order in Missouri is no longer in effect. Measures that are a little less bad but still pretty bad take the place of these things, and we shouldn't count that in as a win when rights are rolled back even if they're maybe rolled back a little less than they initially were. My understanding in Missouri um, is that people who are on Medicaid, which includes a lot of disabled people and people in prisons and jails, can't get state funding for gender affirming care and are just losing out on their gender care given the poverty rates of disabled people and the rates of being on Medicaid, um, the rates of criminalization of disabled people, this is a significant problem for those who are both trans and disabled. I really hope that people who are exclusively in the trans or disabled community can try to be good allies to each other and especially the people who are at the intersection of these things. Absolutely. 
Um, well, I think that's all I have for you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking the time. Sure. Thank you. Part three, what does this have to do with assisted suicide? If you're familiar with our work here at Not Dead Yet, you know we focus mostly on fighting against assisted suicide policies and other ways disabled people are discriminated against in medical settings. So what does all of this have to do with assisted suicide? We've talked a lot in our other videos about how disabled people are put at risk by assisted suicide policies because many disabilities can become terminal without proper care, and our broken healthcare system continues to put people in positions where they cannot afford or otherwise access proper care. We've also talked about how a policy of assisted suicide mainstreams the rationalization of suicidality among disabled people. While non-disabled people are offered suicide prevention services, disabled people can be steered toward assisted suicide because our lives are seen as inherently less valuable than non-disabled lives, and our suicides are deemed rational. It follows, then, that any policy likely to increase suicidality among disabled people is made even more lethal when coupled with legal assisted suicide. And unfortunately, that's exactly what policies banning gender-affirming care for trans-disabled people will do. Recent data indicates that trans adults are over 10 times more likely to consider suicide than the general adult population. Disabled adults are twice as likely to consider suicide compared to the general adult population. The most recent data we have on suicidality among people who are both disabled and trans comes from the 2015 U.S. Transgender Survey, which is pretty out of date at this point, but showed that disabled trans people were significantly more likely to attempt suicide than non-disabled trans people. Side note, I got a lot of this information from the Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund, which published an excellent paper in 2018 titled, Health Disparities at the Intersection of Disability and Gender Identity, a Framework and Literature Review, which is definitely worth a read to learn more about the specific challenges trans disabled people are facing in healthcare settings. I'm really looking forward to seeing more scholarship on this topic that makes use of more recent data because a lot has changed for trans disabled people since 2018. These statistics are important to consider in the face of ableist anti-trans legislation. The people this legislation specifically targets are at the highest risk of suicide, while racialized members of this population face more compounding violence that increases their risk even more. While the vast majority of disabled trans people are not eligible for assisted suicide under current regulations in the U.S., we have seen that states with legal assisted suicide have higher suicide rates overall, which would add another risk factor for this already vulnerable population. Additionally, we've already seen assisted suicides carried out among people who have some of the conditions that would bar them from receiving gender-affirming care, namely eating disorders, in Colorado. As regulations around assisted suicide continue to loosen as it is introduced in more states, and as more people are barred from receiving gender-affirming care, trans-disabled people will continue to be put at greater risk for all forms of suicide. This is yet another reason why we cannot allow assisted suicide policies to pass in 2023 and beyond. Everyone deserves access to safe, high-quality, affirming care. Policies that treat that care and our lives as disposable cannot be allowed to thrive. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to learn more about our work, head to www.notdeadyet.org. See you next time.